This week on The Record, City Hall returns to action. How St. Louis could tackle violence and homelessness. Board of Aldermen President Megan Green is on the record. He's running for Missouri Governor. State Senator Bill Igel is on the record from the campaign trail. Why he wants Missouri to move farther to the right. And the reason his campaign has the attention of former President Trump's campaign. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. We begin with the return of the St. Louis Board of Aldermen coming back into session tomorrow. President Megan Green is now on The Record. Good to have you with us. Thank you. When you swore the oath of office not long ago, uh, you said that the city would address a number of things, including tenants' rights and addressing poverty that leads to homelessness in many mm -hmm. cases. But those numbers are getting worse. Recent statistics show the number of families without a home is up 11%, chronic or long-term homelessness up 13%, a number of those other statistics up on our screen now. Uh, how can St. Louis get at this issue? And I'll just add the context that we know HUD every year is having to claw money back because the city is just not spending the money that we get from the federal government on this issue. What's the holdup? How can we fix it? So a couple of weeks ago, my office partnered with a number of community organizations to have a town hall on housing. We, going into this uh, session, into this next, into the fall, we are focusing on uh, about a half dozen or so housing related bills to get right to the crux of this issue. Uh, first, we're going to be doing an inclusionary zoning bill um, that will require that market rate development set aside a certain number of units as affordable. Second, we're going to be doing a rental registry that um, allows us to keep better track of who landlords are. So if there's problematic properties, we actually have a local contact. Um, and it'll also allow us to keep better track of trends in rentals, what the price differences are year to year. Um, but the, the main piece of that that I think is really important is this impacted tenants fund. Right now in the city of St. Louis, tenants will call the city if their landlord is not taking care of their property. And the city will often come in and say, yeah, this place is not fit for you to be living in, but they will condemn it, which then displaces the, the renter. And so this is a fund that will help uh, tenants if they are in that kind of situation to pay for those relocation expenses, help pay for a down payment on a new uh, apartment um, so that folks aren't getting put out onto the street when they're uh, in a place where their unit is not habitable. Do you have a, a sense on why the city can't get funds out the door and has to forfeit money back to the federal government. If the federal government is giving us money to help yeah. with this issue, shouldn't we put all of that money to use? I think we've also had challenges when it comes to um, serving our unhoused population in particular with not being able to build the capacity, the shelter capacity that we need. Um, just last night, the Planning Commission did forward um, a proposed zoning change that mm -hmm. would make it easier to open uh, homeless shelters throughout the city. We know that if we want to get folks out the street, we have to have a place for them to go, but our zoning laws have been a big impediment to getting that done. Right now you have to get a lot of petitions signed, people from the neighborhood that say, okay, we're going to allow this shelter to open. You want to relax those restrictions. Correct. Um, we want it to go through conditional use rather than the, the plat and petition process. So it would still give the ability for residents around the proposed shelter to, to weigh in on it, to um, for the city to put conditions on the operating of that shelter, um, but it makes it a little bit easier for those nonprofit organizations to be able to open their doors. Another big issue is what's happening at the city jail. Inmates yeah. have died in recent days. A riot has broken out where a guard was taken hostage. And the NAACP and other groups that want to get in there to inspect say they can't get in. They're blocked from access. Yeah. Are you satisfied with the transparency at the city jail? I mean, I, I think that we all have to do better when it comes to our jail. We're, you know, the, the things that we have heard over the last few months in particular have been concerning. And I know that when we get back into session, the Public Safety Committee is going to be focusing on this issue. What can the board do to force the issue of transparency there? I mean, we're looking at our past ordinances right now. The board did pass about a year ago uh, a bill that authorized the Detention Facilities Oversight Board. So I know there's a lot of conversations happening right now about whether that ordinance needs to be changed or updated to make sure that that body is able to do uh, what we intended them to do. The mayor has said, uh, since you've called for changes in leadership, that she remains confident in the leadership mm -hmm. of the jail. Is there a disagreement there? Or have you yeah. come to see something new that the mayor, uh, how do you explain the mayor's degree of confidence 
in leadership at the jail? You know, the, the mayor and I are not going to agree on everything. Um, and I, I think we're able to have pretty productive dialogue around this. I, you know, I, I think our jail commissioner has great experience at the federal level and running a municipal jail is very different. Um, at the municipal level is often the first point of contact that somebody is getting in the criminal justice system. And so that's when we are having to figure out issues related to substance abuse and mm -hmm. mental illness and, uh, and all of these compounding issues that often land people in jail in the first place. But you still want to see change at the and, top. And so I think that there needs to be change at the top. It, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that um, the commissioner leaves. That could mean that we bring in um, some additional expertise that, that knows how to focus on turning around municipal municipal jail systems to help us get going in the right place. A lot of people are watching closely to see what the board might do on guns. Before uh, leaving for the break, the board unanimously voted to restrict uh, open carry only to those people who have a concealed carry permit. But now the mayor, uh, at first she didn't seem convinced the city could take that step. Then something might have changed where she grew more confident in it. Now she's calling on broader gun restrictions. Can the state flout or defy, let me rephrase that, can the city flout or defy state preemption law on this gun issue or not? So we have a handful of bills at the board that are being filed to address the gun violence issue or the easy access of guns that we have in our community. Some of those um, we believe fall within loopholes in state government that allow us the local authority to be able to enact those laws. Other ones we know under state law we are not currently permitted to do, but we have trigger clauses that are put in those bills in the event that we are able to uh, overturn state law either through the legislative process or through ballot initiative or perhaps even a court ruling. There was some talk about, about ballot initiatives that would allow uh, local cities to set their own gun laws, and I don't know if those efforts have faltered or not. Do you hope to see that question on the ballot in 2024? I definitely hope to see that question on the ballot. I, I think that there are different um, perceptions and different needs when it comes to gun safety laws between urban communities like ours and many rural communities. I grew up in a rural community where, you know, the first day of deer season <laughs> was basically a, a holiday. Um, but we have a different reality in the cities, and so I think it makes sense to be able to set different gun laws depending upon what the needs of your community are. And quickly, while we're talking about Jefferson City, Governor Parson used his veto pen to slash out $10 million in extra funding that could have or would have gone toward the emergency response system, a call center yeah. there. Uh, the House whipped enough votes to override that veto and restore that full funding, but the Senate just walked away and adjourned, didn't even take it up for a vote. Uh, how do you see, how, what's your reaction to, to that inaction in the yeah. Senate? Uh, and do you run the risk of spending political capital on gun issues or other social issues and then risking funding in the future if, if you're jousting with Jeff City all the time? Well, I, first I want to thank both the Democratic and Republican lawmakers in the House who did vote to override the veto on the 911 uh, money. We were really disappointed to see that the Senate cho chose to take no action. Um, so that means it's just going to fall back on us again. Um, this fall, I, that's another issue that we anticipate being taken up, whether it's through um, additional ARPA money that maybe needs to be reallocated or through RAM settlement funds. I know that there's a broad commitment across the board to make sure that the final funding is there um, to move forward the public safety access point. All right, well, thank you for joining us. We look forward to covering the action at the board in the days and weeks to come. And speaking of Jefferson City, State Senator Bill Eichel is running for Missouri Governor. He joins us next. What's the forecast in Florida? What's it like in Belleville? No matter where you are. What's, what's the, the forecast in St. Peter's? Or how you get your weather. We know you want the forecast for your backyard. And you want it now. Right here and right now. The five on your side. Weather first team. Focused on you. Welcome back. The field of candidates running for Missouri governor grew larger last week as State Senator Bill Eigel officially launched his campaign in the Republican primary. Senator Eigel is now on the record joining us from the Lake of the Ozarks area uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, Senator, before we get into the campaign conversation, the Senate just adjourned without so much as taking up a vote to override any of Governor Parson's vetoes. We know the House whipped enough votes to override uh, part of his veto that slashed an extra $10 million in funding to help build a modern state-of-the-art 911 emergency response system. Would you have voted to override the governor on that, given the chance? 
Uh, there are several things that I would have voted to override uh, in that budget. And, you know, it, it, and honestly, Mark, by, by the way, thanks for having me. Uh, the budget that we passed this year was an absolute disgrace. And, and Mike Parson is the guy that uh, was the architect of that budget, which was the largest budget we've ever had in the state of Missouri. It included the most wasteful, but most more wasteful spending than we've ever seen before in the state of Missouri, more than $10 billion of new earmarks in that state budget. I refer to this budget as uh, making earmarks great again. So uh, the veto session, which revolves around a discussion if we want to override, what's crazy about this budget is even with all that waste, uh, the governor found things to veto in that budget uh, that actually would have helped everyday Missourians. Uh, the item that you just mentioned, there were pay raises uh, for the highway patrol and our law enforcement that the governor vetoed. Uh, there was an initiative in there uh, that would have helped provide clean drinking water in St. Charles City that the governor decided to veto. So I refer to this budget as the ultimate victory of the swamp over the people because it included a ton of waste. Uh, but at the same time, the governor was vetoing a bunch of items that really would have helped quite a few people in this state. So we need a we need a, a brand new direction at, on the fiscal order of this state. We have been spending billions upon billions of dollars on pork projects, whether it's uh, tens of millions of dollars for private stadium initiatives or there's a there's a 20. $30 million project over in Kansas City right now, building a concrete walking path over the top of I-70. That is precisely the kind of uh, waste that Governor Parson was putting in the budget while vetoing things that I think most Missourians would have been supportive of. So we've got a lot to do uh, to make this better. When I'm the governor of this state, we're going to get these finances under control. We're going to reduce the size of government and we're going to re re we're going to roll the tax savings that we'll realize from that into getting rid of things like personal property tax and income tax. You don't deny that the economy is growing and that goods are more expensive now with inflation than they used to be, right? So naturally, there would be some swelling. It's not apples to apples to compare this year's spending total to one from 2018 or 17, is it? Somewhat. I mean, if you look at what the budget was back in 2010, it was 20 billion. Today, it's 53 billion. So it's more than doubled. Look at the population of the state of Missouri. It's been stagnant for a generation and we're falling behind those other states. And the reason we're falling behind is not because we don't have enough Republicans in Jefferson City to get those big policy ideas done. We have the wrong Republicans in Jefferson City. We have guys like Mike Parson, and it breaks my heart to say that because uh, he claims to be a Republican, but guys like Mike Kehoe and Jay Ashcroft, who have really uh, worked very hard to preserve the status quo in the state, which has seen bigger government every single year to the point that we're stagnating. I'm hearing from Republicans that they're furious about this. I'm traveling all over the state. Mm -hmm. They're furious about this. So we've got to fix that. Senator, you mentioned these these border states in our area, and your campaign rhetoric seems to suggest you want to see Missouri go farther to the right. But border states like Kentucky and Kansas, states that voted heavily in favor of Donald Trump, have also elected Democratic governors. So are, are you running a, a general election campaign, one that can win there, or just trying to make some noise in a primary here? Well, first of all, I, I would argue that the ideas that I'm talking about implementing, uh, cutting, getting rid of personal property tax, getting rid of income tax, uh, protecting Missouri farmland, uh, protecting our elections. Those are things that are not just good for the Republicans of the state. They're good for independents and Democrats as well. When it comes to the finance of the state, Mike Parson is leading a center-left coalition that's making government bigger, uh, that's that's allowing things like the COVID crazy environment to uh, infect our state. We saw a lot of businesses shut down over the past couple of years. We saw the governor not really be a leader on the issues of protecting our rights there. And I think that's what Republicans are furious about. So do I think it's going to make an impact in the primary? Absolutely. Uh, we're seeing the Republican Party want to have folks that aren't just going to say the right things in campaign season, but do the right things once they're in office. Folks are looking for a delete, a leader, a, a really a disruptor of these status quo swamp environments, whether it's in Washington, D.C. or Jefferson City. They're looking for someone that's going to kick over apple carts. When I'm the governor of the state, we are, I'm talking about bringing a reckoning uh, to the status quo that Mike Parson has facilitated, and he would love to see continue under a guy like Mike Kehoe. It's not going to happen with Bill Eigel in charge. Speaking of disruptors, uh, these Republican primaries can be interesting as we see candidates try to embrace former President Trump. He very well may be on the ballot in 2024. Have to ask you about this story reported first in the Post-Dispatch. The Trump campaign has threatened to possibly publicly denounce you and perhaps even sue your campaign or political action committee accusing you of deceiving donors with fundraising emails that ask them to, quote, denounce this witch hunt at the Justice Department and, quote, stand with Trump. Let me ask you this question first. How does a donation to your campaign or to your political action committee help any voter do that, stand with Trump? Well, first of all, because if you look at my message, it's really it's very similar to Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump is probably 
one of the greatest disruptors of the swamp that we've seen in the 21st century. I, I've pushed my message out and we've seen that spread. We've gotten a tremendous response on that. In fact, I, I think that we've had, you know, not just outside of donations, we've had 30,000 people in the state of Missouri sign up on my website to be a part of their team because they're so excited about that message. We have had more folks come to our campaign and be a part of that message and respond to that than any other gubernatorial campaign in the country. And I couldn't be more appreciative of everything and every person that is sending as little as a dollar to my campaign to support me. So every uh, message that I'm putting out through my campaign is about Bill Igel and joining with cultural icons like Donald Trump that want to upend the status quo. So I think that's going to continue to be a message. I think people are going to continue to respond to it. And it's not surprising that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch is going to look for any opportunity to attack me. They're terrified about that, Mark, because they know, unlike a Mike Kehoe and unlike a Jay Ashcroft, I am basically, by going directly to the people and getting lots of folks to support my campaign at a low level, I'm bypassing all the traditional establishment donor power bases in Jefferson City. And they are absolutely terrified by that. Well, mm -hmm. they're going to be a lot more terrified when I'm the governor of the state because it's their apple carts I'm coming to kick over. Well, Wasn't it the Post-Dispatch that uh, originated this quote? It was the Trump campaign, his lawyer, saying that you are deceiving donors of their hard-earned dollars by making false and deceptive statements, implying that donations are going to support Trump and that by donating, the donor would stand with Trump. Would you call on the political action committee in uh, your support to give those contributions, any and all contributions garnered from this messaging to the Trump Legal Defense Fund? See, I, unfortunately, I can't control anything that the outside organization Is that does. the right thing for them to do? Uh, I, I, I think that every message that I've put out, and quite frankly, that I've seen from these outside groups uh, is focused on Bill Eichel. Now, the reality is because my message is so close to Donald Trump, it's hard to be it's, it's hard to talk about being a disruptor in this day and age and somehow uh, not also be talking about the other major disruptor that we're proud of and are supporting in our country right now. And that's Donald Trump. And I expect honestly, I expect that we're going to continue our message of being someone that's going to cut against the grain in Jefferson City. And I can't control uh, what's happening uh, for outside groups. You know, outside groups are going to do what outside groups are going to do. Uh, I know that I'm going to continue to support the president. I think he's the right guy for the job. If there's a way that uh, I can work together and closely for him, certainly we're going to do that. But hey, when Donald Trump's the next president of this country and I'm the next governor of this state, that is going to be a tandem that is going to work out uh, in a fantastic manner for the people of the state of Missouri. All right, Senator Eigel joining us from the campaign trail virtually. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And next, cash bail, a thing of the past in Illinois. What one area judge says as the Safety Act comes into clearer focus next week. Most people think this is St. Louis, but we know better. It's our neighborhoods, our people, and that's our focus. Because no story is bigger than the one that affects you. Five on your side, focused on you. Time now for a quick recap of top political headlines. The president's son now faces criminal charges. Just hours ago, a special prosecutor filed an indictment seeking a conviction against Hunter Biden for federal firearms crimes. This comes weeks after an initial plea deal fell apart. Should that case go to trial, its details could spill out into the public eye just as President Biden seeks re-election. Cash bail in Illinois will soon be a thing of the past. The state's Supreme Court upheld the Pretrial Fairness Act a portion of the broader Safety Act that recently abolished cash bail. That means judges can no longer detain a suspect accused of nonviolent offenses until their trial. St. Clair County's Chief Judge Andrew Gleason told us the task of adapting all these changes has been quite daunting, but he believes the new system could end up being a positive thing. He says the new system will keep dangerous people behind bars. If somebody's dangerous, we're detaining them, and I don't think that's, well, I'm sure that's not going to change. If we find someone to be dangerous to themselves or to the community at large, they'll be detained. In place of money bond, judges will now have to use a risk assessment tool and fill out forms to decide which defendants will go to jail as they wait for their day in court. He ran for president in 2012. Now he's resigning his post in the Senate, at least not seeking re-election in 2024. Mitt Romney says the Republican Party, or a large portion of it, left him, not the other way around. He's calling for a new generation of leaders to step forward in an apparent rebuke of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. The third party group that bills itself as no labels said Senator Mitt Romney is an exceptional public servant and we agree wholeheartedly with his belief that America needs a new generation of leaders to step up. When we come back, we check the record on just how the age of politicians might impact the way voters think about them. Get the content that matters to you on your time. 
Breaking news as it happens. We are following breaking news at this hour. Weather alerts when you need them. Live streams and newscasts on your schedule. On air, online, on our app, and on 5 Plus. No matter where you go or how you watch, Five on your side, focused on you. Author and journalist John Dickerson wrote a book about the American presidency and called it the hardest job in the world. Certainly its pressures are known to age a person, but what is that ideal age? If you were the hiring manager, asking the job seeker's age would be asking for a discrimination lawsuit. But voters can and often do ask that very question of the person seeking the highest office in the land. Polling from Pew Research indicates about half Americans want their president to be in their 50s. But persuasive candidates can still make their case that time on the job doesn't necessarily disqualify them. Nearly 40 years ago, similar questions were swirling around a 73-year-old incumbent president, Ronald Reagan. At the time, the oldest person to ever seek the job. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. Didn't make it an issue either. Reagan would go on to win a near clean sweep, picking up 49 states. He was 73. Next inauguration day, Donald Trump will be 78, Joe Biden 81. Don't expect either candidate to make age an issue of their campaign either. Just today, Trump said of President Biden, quote, he's not too old at all. That does it for us. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right back here at the same time next week as we celebrate the one year anniversary of this program. Until then, we're off the record.